Next up, we have Madison Winfield, who is joining us as an undergraduate student from Howard University. Um, Madison worked with Rachel McQuarrie, or sorry, Alessandra Franchin and uh, Chang Min Cho uh, in ACOM. And the title of her uh, oral presentation today is Knox and Ozone Instrumentation or Instrument Comparison for Asia AQ. Yeah. Ready, Maddie? Oh, yeah. All right, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hello. I'm Madison Winfield, and this is my presentation on NO2 and, instrument, and ozone <laughs> instrument comparison for Asia AQ. So, um, as my introduction, Asia AQ is a field project by NASA. Within this campaign, from February to March of 2024, we used two aircrafts to improve the integration of satellite observations with air quality ground monitoring sites. The cities chosen are highly urbanized Asian cities with high levels of air pollution. Um, in this work, we focus <coughs> excuse me, on NO2 and ozone in four cities, Seoul, Korea, Taipei, Taiwan, uh, Manila, Philippines, and Bangkok, Thailand. So our motivation for doing this, uh, the choice to monitor ozone and NOx was done in part because of the EPA's growing regulations on ozone and NO2 as they are extremely hazardous to people. Some of the few health effects, some of the many health effects that can occur are um, irritation of the lungs, making it harder to breathe, and increased risk of asthma attacks. So NO2 and ozone also affect the climate as they can create what we refer to as secondary pollutants. Um, that could include ozone, acid rain, and uh, particulate matter. NO2 is emitted by combustion processes or lightning primarily. Um, light, I mean light, <laughs> O3 is formed from, chemical from a chemical reaction in the atmosphere. So if NO2 gets introduced to the atmosphere, it can then create ozone. So this is why we are measuring NO2 and ozone in AJQ. So now for an overview of our instruments. Um, our chemiluminescence instrument that I will be referring to as CL measures NO2, O3, and NO. Rapid ozone experiment, which I will refer to as ROSE, measures O3 or ozone. Um, and compact airborne NO2 experiment, or CANOE, measures NO2. So we're using three different instruments because we are trying to guarantee redundancy. We want, we want our findings to be consistent no matter the device. Um, moreover, if one instrument doesn't work, by this method we have a backup. Um, as you can see, we use two different instruments for each pollutant, and I will now detail each instrument individually. So CANOE, the working principle uh, within CANOE is that it uses laser-induced fluorescence, or what we refer to as LIF. So LIF is a method that uses a laser to excite the NO2 molecules. Those excited NO2 molecules will then emit light, and when they relax to their ground state, um, they are detected with a photomultiplier. We also call a photomultiplier a PMT. So ROSE is actually is a little bit different. Um, its working principle is that it uses UV absorption. And oh, I'm really fancy now. <laughs> we use a LED that's at 260 nanometers. Um, we then shoot it through our gas sample here. Um, and we do this because ozone is known to absorb this rate of light. So we use two mirrors to keep the light from escaping, and then um, the, and then once we're done, the light is then measured with a photomultiplier. So different, some, the way that ROSE is different from our other two instruments is that instead of the PMT measuring like how many, how many photons are released, we're measuring how much is absorbed by the ozone. So chemiluminescence, CL, the working principle within uh, chemiluminescence is that it, photons are generated via a chemical reaction. So we have, it uses a two-channel system. So NO, if we have a sample of NO, we're going to flush the system with an excess of O3. This is then going to create um, a certain amount of NO2 that's excited. So when it's excited, it emits light, which, which means it emits photons. And we can measure those photons with our PMT. Uh, O3 measurements work the same, but instead of NO being in our sample, O3 is in our sample, and we um, 
push through an excess of NO into our gas sample, and it releases an excited amount of NO, and then we measure the photons from that. NO2 is a little different, though, because we have to use a conversion cell that then photolysizes um, NO2 into NO, and then we can do what we did with the other two uh, systems. Um, another important thing to note is that um, the amount of light generated by the relaxation of NO2 to a ground state um, that we then measure with PMT um, is proportional to the original amount of NO2 or O3. So now that we've gotten a knowledge of the instrumentation, we can now move on to our results. So this is a flight path over uh, the Philippines on February 6th of this year, 2024. <laughs> but this is a specific look at NO2. And as you can see, when we look at our little gradient here, NO2 is kind of, um, it's very minimal, I'll say. I will, I will not say that it's zero, but it is very minimal. However, when we look at this region here where, that I've made, labeled Manila, we see something different. And here's for my cool animation. <laughs> but why we're seeing why we're seeing so much variety of color and activity, <laughs> excuse me, there is because um, Manila is a highly urbanized and industrialized um, city within the Philippines. Manila is the capital of the Philippines, and it is also surrounded by power plants or and other industrial factories. So by so through this, we can tell that this is how the area looks. Um, the rest of the Philippines isn't as industrialized, so you're not going to see as much emissions. Now, this is our time series comparison between the NO concentration that's read by CL and the concentration that's read by CANU. Um, something also to note is that the image is in regard to pressure. So the light blue here um, is CL and the purple is CANU and you kind of can't see the blue, and that's a good thing because that means they're overlapping with each other, which, which tells us that they're agreeing with each other and that we're getting a more accurate reading on what's happening, even though the pressure is obviously drastically changing. And we can see the same thing when we look at our scatter plot here. Something to note is that the dots are not telling you the concentration. The dots are just telling you at what um, pressure altitude it is at. But because they, the dots are aligned on more of a streamlined path, we know that we're getting a closer reading. However, since our correlation co coefficient is 0.90, that's still very good. It's not perfect, though. So we still have those outliers. If you look at the top in the surrounding areas, and those are things that we need to figure out why it's happening. And here's our same flight path, but with O3 which has a lot more going on than NO2 does, and that is partially because O3 is a secondary pollutant. So um, whatever's reacting with the atmosphere can create O3 and making it more concentrated than NO2. Now, this is the same sort of time series that we were seeing before with NO2, but with ozone. So this, the blue lines are CL, and the pink is uh, rose, but something to note is that there's a lot more separation between the two than there was with, with than there was with NO2, um, and that shows us that there's a significant amount of disagreement. Why that disagreement's happening, we're not too sure yet. Um, but something worth noting is that the when the pressure is low, we, we're seeing that they're agreeing more. Um, we don't have a definitive answer for why that's happening, but it is something to point out. Okay, and this is our scatter plot of that, and as you can see, the two are deviating from each other along our um, adjusted line, and the correlation coefficient is 0.74, which is significantly lower than our um, NO2 sample, which suggests that there's more disagreement than before. So pivoting to a different date, um, I thought we could talk about our flight on February 11th. Um, I thought it would be the best date to show the water dependency as it is um, a very dramatic disagreement. As you can see, different from whenever we were considering pressure, um, when we were considering pressure, there was more consistency. Here we're seeing consistency, uh, a consistency in separation. So this is telling us that 
there is a significant amount of disagreement uh, between the CL instruments and the ROSE instruments when, um, when we compare it to water vapor levels. Um, we think this may be because of O3's tendency to react with water, um, but we don't have a definitive, an definitive answer for the separation. Um, and just like before, NO2 is agreeing with each other pretty consistently throughout the um, entire time series. So in conclusion, there's a good amount of agreement between instruments measuring NO2 regardless of water vapor or altitude. Um, the ozone measurements show some disagreement that looks related to altitude and water vapor. However, it's important to highlight that we are not sure which instrument is the correct one. Uh, this requires more work to determine what are the specific causes of, for the disagreement. And finally, thank you to my mentors, Alessandro Franken, Chang Ming Cho, and thank you to my NSF Nessie directors, Benjamin Feldman and Jerry Sicconi. Um, thank you to my Nessie cohort, and thank you to my family. And yeah. Great job, Madison. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have some questions for Maddie? Again, we can take questions online or in person. That was a great, that was a great presentation, Maddie. Um, do you mind pulling up the plot that showed, I believe it was the NO2 and the discrepancy between the two flights? The pressure or water vapor? Pressure. Pressure. Go, go. yep. We're not there yet. There we go. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Chill out. Okay, there we go. Or wait, sorry, the one with the O3, what the difference is. Okay, yeah. Two, three. One more over. Yes. Um, so when I was initially looking at it, for me, just with my eyes, especially with all the peaks and the discrepancies, it looks like the O3CL tends to peak higher in magnitude than the O3ROZE. <laughs> Did you have any idea why? that might be happening or any kind of insight into that maybe? I could, um, I could imagine that it is because um, rose measures in absorption, whereas um, CL measures in release. So they might be getting different um, numbers through that, but I don't have a definitive answer for that. Yeah. Thank you. Do you know how UV light plays into the ozone? Because UV obviously creates ozone. Yeah. So I was wondering if any of these instruments would take that into consideration, like even with the water vapor re increasing or reducing. Rose would probably take that. Rose would probably be the one to take that most into consideration because um, it measures absorption instead. Um, but I think that's my best answer for you on that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that presentation, Maddie. It was really awesome, and you're a great speaker. Um, I don't know much about NASA instrumentation, but I have some friends that are hydrologists, and I know that they're constantly battling with instrument calibration. And so I was wondering, between your instrumentation, which one uh, you would consider the most calibrated, and if you looked into that at all, and why that, if that might be giving you some of like the differences in uh, measurement. It definitely is giving us the differences in measurement because of O3's ability to just react with um, H2O. However, was that a part of my part of the research? No, but what you asked about um, if that's in the, ca like which, did you say which like instrument? Mm -hmm. I would imagine that CO would probably give our better read. Mm -hmm. um, because it, because there's a chemical reaction reaction happening, I don't think that Rose would really be able to quantify that as well because it's about absorption. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm 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 her mentor. Uh, Maddie Maddie can't know uh, about calibrations because she wasn't in the field. 
Uh, and there's only so much information I can tell her in a uh, in few months. Uh, both instruments are are calibrated uh, roughly in the same frequency. Um, the absorption measurement tends to have more interference with other molecules, uh, and it was not uh, behind a pressure controlled inlet. Um, so while the chemiluminescence sees always the same pressure, and the pressure you see is pressure altitude, so the pressure is varying that much while outside the airplane, airplane the CL instrument sees always the same pressure, while um, the ROSE instrument needs to be corrected for changing pressure. Uh, so there could be um, there could be that that plays a role. However, Maddie did a great job plotting all sorts of stuff versus all sorts of stuff, and <laughs> and and we are still not quite sure uh, what's the prime cause, except those hunch about water water vapor and um, an altitude that needs to be dug further, maybe with some uh, lab work as well. Yeah, if we had two more months of the internship. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Maddie, do you know if there's a correlation from what the measurements you got at altitude to what it is on the ground? Is this is there a way that you can correlate that data that we could uh, kind of forecast or guess what the conditions are to the people by literally just flying over them? No, I, I, I do not know. <laughs> I do not yeah. know. And that's a fair response. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Madison? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.